I actually intended this to be a continuation of what I spoken earlier on. I think a few months ago I spoke about pursuit of happiness. So I wanted this sort of to be a continuation. And um, I think the proposed topic was something about causes of un- of unhappiness or something like that. But I actually intended this to be called the topic to be called the pursuit of unhappiness. But I think you might think it too controversial. But it's really what I intended to talk about: the pursuit of unhappiness. And what I wanted to talk about was that in many many occasions, on many occasions, what we think is our pursuit of happiness actually ends up being a pursuit of unhappiness, unknowingly, because of our ignorance. So I don't have a particular theme running through. I just wanted to raise some examples. Now I have a put a strong caveat uh, to whatever I say. Um, I take myself as a subject, you know. I, I do research. So I take myself as a perfect human uh, subject for this topic because I'm talking a little... Sometimes when I talk, it's about my own experience. So it doesn't mean that I've actually, obviously not, uh, gone out of this uh, cycle of suffering or that I've really, you know, been the happiest person on earth. What I'm telling you is some of my own journey and some of my own fallacies. Okay, so take it in that light, all right? So, in, if you don't remember, my own perception of what happiness is, is the following. And, and before even I start, just understand that from a first moment, there's the first moment of context using our, six, our senses, okay? Whether with our eyes, our ears, our nose, tongue, body, or even the mind. There's also there's a first moment of contact. And that first moment of contact, you will experience one of three sensations, which is either pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. So you can't really stop that. You cannot stop that. So it naturally comes. You either feel pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. So if there was someone brewing some coffee okay, here, you smell it, you might think it's a pleasant smell or unpleasant for some people. For example, durian, smell of durian. Okay, well, you know, for me it will be unpleasant. I'm not a typical Singaporean. I'm Singaporean, by the way, but for me it will be an unpleasant. This is a smell. Or it could be pleasant. If you touch something warm, for some it might feel it's pleasant, unpleasant, or it could be neutral. So you have this primary sensation. For us, we don't stop there, at least for me and for many of us, I think. Beyond that first sensation, there is a second moment of thought and there's a third moment. So after having the initial sensation, so let's say it was the smell of coffee and assume that you like coffee, there was a smell, a whiff of coffee. And subsequent to that, the mind activates, recognizes that it is coffee and after recognizing that it is coffee, then what happens? Another thought arises that I like to drink coffee. And then after that, another thought arises that where can I get coffee? And then another thought arises since you are sitting here and the coffee is outside and probably you feel that it's not so nice to go outside, then you, you might get some dis-ease now. Not disease, eh, but dis-ease, unease that... Oh, what a disappointment. I can't get my coffee. So then you start feeling a little unhappy. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? So from one thought moment to another thought moment, you know, we start creating certain expectations. We start creating certain wishes which may be fulfilled or unfulfilled. And then after that, you get yet another thought, another thought of feeling happy, happy or unhappy along with the associated emotion. And so when we talk about the pursuit of happiness or the pursuit of unhappiness, I'm talking about some of the activities that we actually do or some of our mental states we engage in when we think we are actually pursuing or trying to get happiness. So happiness, therefore, or not therefore, in addition, happiness, as I've mentioned before, is actually a a state, a mental state that lies between two pieces of suffering. 
you know, I, I give the example of a sandwich, right? So it could be if you are, there could be vegetarian ham or real ham, all right? But it's a piece of ham that lies between two pieces of bread. Now, call these two pieces of bread because they are quite bland. The suffering, between two pieces of suffering, you have the happiness. So if you have happiness, then it will be lying between two intervals of suffering. Now, don't take suffering literally. Suffering means that it is at a le- mental level of, of uh, so-called uh, pleasantness, below that of your happiness. So if this is happiness, then it obviously has to lie between two moments that is lo- in lower intensity, all right, lower intensity than that feeling of what you call an hap- a happy feeling. You, you have to do that because otherwise that feeling is neutral. If it's of the same frequency, same level, then obviously you won't feel that you're feeling happy because it's at the same level. So for you to think you're feeling happy, it means that you must be feeling less happy before that. Otherwise, there's no f- so-called feeling of happiness. Now, having said this, therefore, let me just raise a few of the so-called fallacies okay, that I engage in, some of us engage in, maybe some more people or most people engage in. I want to tell you a story of this uh, tortoise. Uh. There's this tortoise. Uh, I don't know if I heard of this. <laughs> the family of tortoise went for a picnic. Okay, so they went to this park and it took a long time. Okay, to crawl to this park. Actually, I came from the Kenridge Park anyway, so that's very silly anyway. So, but the tortoise. Okay, imagine the tortoise having to crawl to this Kenridge Park from wherever they were. Okay, so does it take a long time? It takes a long time, right? So they were so happy, and then the father, mother, the brothers, everyone started unpacking the food and wanted to eat. And then after that, the youngest tortoise said, Oh my goodness, did someone remember to bring the lettuce? And then they said, Oops, we forgot. So the baby, the youngest tortoise said, Oh, okay. Well, we thought a picnic can't be complete without this letter, so I will go back and get it. But, she says, none of you are supposed to eat, okay, before I come back. Promise? So everyone said, yeah, sure, we promise, we promise. So the little tortoise went and crawled, okay, but he thinks that those guys can't be trusted. So he hid behind a tree, okay, and watched, because he thinks that they won't keep that promise. So he watched and watched. And from morning, he watched until close to evening. Okay, And then finally, one of his siblings got a little hungry and says, Mom, I'm so hungry. You know, I don't think, I think he, he lost his way. So I'm just going to eat a bit. And everyone was looking at the sun is setting. So might as well make do with whatever they have, right? Rather than let the food rot. So they started eating. At which point in time, the youngest tortoise jumped out of the behind the tree and raised, you know, to the picnic ground and said, there I told you, I knew that you would eat before I came back. So what's the moral here of this story? Was the little tortoise very happy? Was he very happy? Was he happy when he left? Was he happy when he left to get the letters? He was not happy. Was he happy when he was hiding behind the tree? He was not happy. Was he happy when they finally started to eat? Not happy. So, but he created his own unhappiness. He created his own unhappiness. He did. He basically was creating his own unhappiness. Now, getting back here, what was he creating? And is that something that we do normally in our life? Is that something, can you think of an example that we do that all the time in terms of how we interact with people? And the whole idea, actually, to, to make it simple, is that we do. And what do we do? We actually have certain expectations of what people will do, right? Or what we expect of people. And then with, ex- with this expectation, you know, we are then looking at people with tinted glasses. So we are actually expecting people to, to actually exit behavior according to our expectations, and actually, if we have very strong expectations, it's doom if they do and doom if they don't. Because if they do, then you say, aha, like a little tortoise. You say, there you are. All right, it's an expectation that, you know, that was a negative expectation. And if they don't, then you still have that suspicion of them, perhaps. Now, this expectation that the tortoise had was something unpleasant, 
right? Which is that he didn't think that they were going to wait for him. But sometimes you also have expectations of others, and which is actually something good. So you expect someone to act, you know, like a Mother Teresa, right? And then if that person doesn't act like a Mother Teresa, you become disappointed, right? Wrong. So, for example, um, so there may be people you respect and you expect them to behave in a particular way, they don't, and then you get disappointed. So, you know, all you have a loved one, for example, you expect the loved one to be like, you know, the best of everything. Again, the loved one doesn't live up to your expectations, you get disappointed and unhappy. So, in other words, we are actually creating a lot of expectations and it's actually making us unhappy. So, this is fallacy number one. And actually this fallacy is what I think personally as I start watching myself and watching others and is that we seem to you know Shakespeare actually talked about, you know, all the world's a, a stage, isn't it? Right? The whole world is a stage. Well it is true. Life is but the play. But for some of us, we actually take this story very literally. We take the story that we are living in very seriously. And because we take it so seriously, we actually create our own unhappiness. I'll tell you why. From two levels. I start from a very basic level, then I move to the level of what Shakespeare was talking about. First, in our minds, we are actually very great novelists. You know, people you know, write Harry Potter stories and all that, they think they are great novelists. Well, actually, I think we are the best novelists because what happens is that in our minds, we always create stories. I don't know whether you are, you are aware that we are creating stories all the time. The mind doesn't stop functioning. The mind creates stories of what could have been, what has happened. So, for example, if something happens, so someone is late for an appointment, for most of us, immediately our mind spins and try to create a, a story about why this is, person is late or not late. And they say, oh, he's always late. That's your story now. Your story is that this person, this is a disposition. That means he's dispositionally, he's habitually, characteristically late. And you become happy or unhappy. So some others, you create a story and say, well, maybe it's a traffic. But it's still a story, right? The story is that the person is held by traffic, therefore he's late. So I think it's a ten habitual tendency that's a bit hard to break, which is whenever we encounter an incident, we, our mind starts spinning into the second thought moment, third thought moment, fourth thought moment, and start creating a story. The mind spins and creates stories. And with these stories, you either get upset or you create a story where you feel that you won't be that upset. But it's still a, a story. Sometimes a story is an expedient method, but other times a story is a story that makes you extremely unhappy. And I think I've told you this or you've uh, heard this before. There was this man who lost an axe. Have you heard that before? The man who lost an axe, this farmer lost his axe. And he just couldn't find it. And so, but he remembered that the day before he saw the neighbor's boy, you know, sneaking around his barnyard. So he says that little thief must have taken my axe. So, but because he was a neighbor's son, he, was, he didn't feel very good, you know, accusing the boys. But anyway, he kept it in his heart and he was very angry at the boy. And every time he saw the boy, he said, there goes that little thief. So when the little thief, so he speaks, or so he thinks, walks by his barn, his farm, and waves to him and says, oh, see, he's guilty, right? He took the axe, he feels bad, so therefore he's trying to be nice to me and wave to me. See, so there goes that little thief. You know, when the boy comes home and plays around, he says, there he goes, trying to observe my barn and see what else he can take. In other words, whatever that the boy does was dissatisfactory to him. He just thinks that the boy is a thief. Until a few days later, when he was cleaning the barnyard, and lo and behold, under the stack of hay, he found his axe. So now he says, oh. And when he looks at the boy, he says, well... That sounds like and looks like a nice little boy who's playing. And when the boy waves, he says, Wow, what a polite boy. Same action, but different mindsets, different sets, states of happiness or, or unhappiness. Do you understand? A story. We are just living in our story. 
I'm not even saying that you know that um, when he finds out that the boy did not take his axe and that he feels that the boy is a nice boy, that he was actually you know uh, in a proper state of mind. Because at that point, he's still living in a story. But the stories either make you happy or unhappy. The stories that you create in your mind either makes you look at people nicely or you know, in a hostile manner. Still a story in the mind. Now with these stories, let me go on to a higher level. Okay? And this might be a... Uh, well, let's hope. Let's see whether we can appreciate this idea of a story that we spin in our head. From these stories that we create in our head, we can actually move to a higher level of stories that we create around us. And these stories is actually a story that create, society creates. So, I think well, okay, we are. You call yourself. You know, we ask who who are you? We say, you know, I'm a teacher. You know, I'm a secretary. I'm a husband. I'm a wife. I'm a son. I'm a father. You all have these roles, right? Are you are, are you all this? Father, mother, son, children. One, if you look at it, actually, these are all roles that you play. These are also stories. You are actually just characters that is mean that you are playing. You are characters and actors and actresses in a big story. Now, you say you are very aghast. How can I even say that if I'm a father or a mother, I'm, I'm an actor? Do you think you're an actor if you're a father or a mother? Or you, dis- you disagree with me? Let me ask you. If I say that if you, whatever role you're playing, you're a secretary, you're a teacher, you're a father, are you an actor or are you not an actor? How many of you think you're not an actor then? How many of you think you are an actor when you're actually a father, mother? The rest can't decide. Well, let me tell you why, you th- why I think we are still playing, we are still an actor or whatever. If you're a father, society and your own innate character, your own innate conscience requests that you, in general, okay, try to bring up your children. Yes or no? Society, on you, your own conscience requires that you know you treat your wife nicely. Right? Actually, in the past, traditionally, if you're a wife, Especially in Chinese uh, culture, the wife is expected to what? Cook, wash dishes, and do all these things, right? Correct. Last time, you know, wash the husband's feet and all that, right? No, I mean all that, right? Society had all these requirements. So, if you are a secretary, society requires that you know you actually have to do certain things to get your earn your living. There are certain norms in society, yes or no? There are certain norms in society. So, therefore, we are actually acting out in a play where there's no director, but where everyone else is a director, yes or no? There's no one f- main director, but everyone in the past and in the current situation is acting as a director because through the common collective expectations and norms, we are playing out certain roles, yes? So we are all actors and actresses. But we take our roles very seriously and very often we forget that we are actually just actors and actresses in the play. So, you know, let's talk about real actors and actresses. I don't know where they are. There used to be... There's someone in the committee, right, who's a, uh, an actor? Ah, well, someone. Okay, maybe you should ask him to share his... But, you know, actors and actresses, they, when they are in a role, they are very serious about it. But they know that once they get out of the set, they are no longer in the play. Yes or no? Now for us, we don't. We think this is real. A lot of times this is real. And we are holding on to it very seriously. And we are ex- holding on this role and expectation so seriously that when anyone violates that role, the expectations in the role, we get very upset. But you understand that all these are just figments of our thoughts. You really have to understand this. I'm not saying that we stop being playing the role of father or mother. I'm not asking you to do that. I'm asking you to please continue to do that. I'm just asking you to just take a step back and understand that you are just playing a role. Nothing more or less than that. And with that role claim certain expectations. 
And with this expectation, it means that when someone violates it, somehow you feel that there's a violation of the expectation. You get angry. You get unhappy. But why? I'm ask, we're trying to get an understanding of why you're so unhappy. The understanding or the re- reasoning is that it comes from this expectation of the role. You follow? And these roles, when you take it too seriously, becomes muddled because you don't even know what you really think. You don't know, really know who you are. And innately, we are not fathers, mothers. Innately, we are not children. You know, we are not a teacher. We are not a secretary. We are not a manager. Intrinsically, we're just humans, okay, reacting to a lot of causes and conditions in the world. And that's exactly what the Buddha says, right? Intrinsically, we are just acting according to causes and conditions. Except that now we have layered upon it certain expectations because of the role. Now, there's this uh, idea that you may have heard of about certain clowns. You know clowns? And they are not even clowns. They are actually like actors. They actually put on uh, a smiley face Right, and then they just paint themselves up, right? And they just play this role again and again and again and again. And I remember, I think I remember seeing an interview, or actually a commentary, that one of the sad things huh, about these people when they actually go out and then they just paint the face and act in a particular way, that when they do that very often, they sort of actually even forget who they are after they take off the makeup. In other words, they actually even forget how they feel anymore. They've actually lost touch with their own true feelings and sensations and all they are living is in that role. Now, I don't know whether you understand this. In other words, they are taken in so much by the role which is that of a smiley face that all they have, all they know is smiley, 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 smiley and they are just completely now numb to whatever their own feelings and sensations are. There's that they have lost that layer because you are just looking at the expectation of like preserving a smiley face. Why do I say that? I'm saying that because when we are so caught up, no, we are so caught up in a particular role that we play, so caught up in our own thinking. So I'm looking at the thinking level, and this thinking is not your first moment, it's actually a multi moments later, you have certain expected. You're always caught up in that thinking that you actually lose touch with the first moment of thoughts, with the first moments of feeling and sensation. And when we are living in a world of thoughts, Unfortunately, we actually lose our humanity, meaning to say that we lose our attributes as a human, which is the human, both with direct thoughts and direct perceptions. And that direct thought and direct sensation is actually that first moment, not that multiple moments. Multiple moments later, when you're talking about multiple layers of thought, we are actually talking about someone now who is living in a, la- in a world of thought, World of thoughts, actually, as I put it, is really a world of stories. We are just living in our own mental stories. I don't know whether you still get my point, because a lot of time when we get unhappy with someone, why are you unhappy with someone? Please tell me. Why? We, can you just tell me right now? Have you ever been angry before? Yes. Why? Why are you angry with someone? An example? Because what? Because someone was... Well, because someone scolded me, right? That's when we are lining up to get some food and someone just cuts in. Are you happy or unhappy? Generally unhappy, right? Quite unhappy, right? Why? Well, if you believe that there's a norm, right? That everyone should kill, right? Right? That there must be equity in this world, right? So because someone cuts the queue, you get unhappy. But Why? Can you see that we are just creating our own unhappiness? So there must be certain norms. And so you can tell the person that these are the norms. But do you need to get unhappy? Actually, not necessary. You can still politely tell for the society to function. You can say, hey, look, you need to queue up. But is there a need to be unhappy? Not necessary. But because we work by norms, we have a story and the story is everyone should queue up. No one should cut in front of me. You get very unhappy. So... 
Think of any instance where you're unhappy and then there is this, somehow there might likely be a story behind it. It's your mental story. I'll give you an example, and this one might be more controversial. Let's say death of a loved one. Unhappy? Yeah, we are sad, right? But the prolongedness, the prolonged sadness that comes after that, the griefing that comes after that, often is a result of a story. I don't know whether you agree or disagree. I'm going to throw an egg at me right now. A rotten one. We are sad when a loved one goes away. Or let's say we are sad when we have, uh, not even a loved one goes away, your boyfriend, a breakup, okay? There's a sadness, right? But actually, if you think about it, the prolonged unhappiness or the griefing, when they go, say the person could have died but just left your life or so, that's whatever. That prolonged griefing, is it sometimes or more often a result of the story we are telling ourselves? The stories that we are reliving, yes or no? It is still a, re- a story that we are reliving. So let's say break up with a girlfriend or a boyfriend. So, okay, then after that, breaking up, right? It's hard to do, isn't it? Okay, so you sing all your songs and whatever. Okay, all right, okay, I'm no singer. But after that, what do you, happens? Sometimes you think of the person, right? Is that a thought? Then after that, what do you think? That person is good for nothing. He did this to me, did that to me. And you get angry, right? Sad, right? Hurts, right? But again, please see that it is again a story we are telling ourselves and we are holding on to that. Source of unhappiness. Source of unhappiness. That's exactly what it is. And if you want to move this even further, sometimes we relish in leaving these roles. I tell you what, you say, what? The, man, the person must be psychotic. So, let's say we talk about people uh, in general, it can be a man or a woman, okay, who keeps getting into relationships where, you know, he or she is being abused. Abuse not in the physical abuse, but always in the same pattern, okay? The person is over reliant on, on, on him or her, you know, and it's in a relationship that. It's just not going to work. But the person keeps going into into that relationship. Have you seen people like that? There are people who keep going into circumstances or relationships, which is a similar pattern. If you know a friend, and the friend keeps going into certain... And watch yourself too. Keep going into similar patterns of relationship that isn't going to work. Why? Now, psychologically, psychologically, Actually, even in such situations, you say, why would someone who's seeking for happiness, looking out for happiness, why would he continually go into a role where it, he keeps going, getting in a situation where he knows that he, or we could have predicted that you were going to be going to end up being unhappy? And if you go try to go into that, uh, then you go into psychology and the psychiatry of things. Well, sometimes, for whatever reasons, uh, people feel that there's a need to play a victim role. I'm just giving an example. A victim. And you would see that there are people who keep playing a victim role. There are different theories about why this happens. But victim people, I'm actually getting out of, uh, going very distracted at this point uh, because we are going out of the team. But very quickly, and I'll stop, I'll move back to the central team. Now. People move into a victim role sometimes because for whatever reasons, you know, they haven't gotten out of that emotional knot of being a victim and they keep going into that again to relieve it. And it's just a natural response because they keep relieving it. Presumably one day they will actually overcome it. It's a very complex theory. Like. In a sense, sometimes these people may disagree with that theory. But I'm just saying that sometimes people play that role, a victim role. It's a story that subconsciously or consciously they are holding on to. And they keep going to that situation. But really, this would need a different discussion all that. So let's move back to this happiness thing. And the reason I got into this was that we actually become unhappy because we actually hold on to a role. We actually go by the stories that we have in our minds. Roles that we have, I repeat again, are actually still stories that's collectively uh, formed by society. And 
you know, if you look at someone who's enlightened, the enlightened person will actually see that at some point in time, all these roles are actually figments of the imagination, right or wrong. At some point in time, it's all empty. At some point in time, he's just not going to cling on to this anymore. And which is why he can actually so-called leave the world. Because it's like, what? You know, be subjected to all these norms and all that. You know, but that's another story altogether. I actually wanted to talk about something else, but since there's so little time and I don't think I want to continue talking about happiness, let me just talk about something else. Oh, yeah, which is actually the fallacies, the certain fallacies of um, what we think is happiness. Now, some of times we want control, right? So, do you think that having control, would it be a source of happiness to you or is it not a source of happiness to you? Do you prefer to be under control or do you prefer to be in control? Most of you? Ah, neither. Middle. Oh. Well, like that, very hard, right? I mean, it's like... Huh? So, they did a survey. Okay, let me not talk about you then. They did a survey... Because you are all enlightened beings, it's very hard to get a response from you. So they did a survey of people and asked them, suppose, okay, you say, touch it, touch it, touch it, find a piece of wood to touch first, okay? So they asked them, okay, not you, they asked them, suppose you had cancer, would you prefer to have a choice of your own treatment? Or would you prefer to let the doctor choose for you? So what do you think what the majority chose? Own treatment or let the doctor choose? Have a choice or no choice? Or let the doctor choose? Huh? General, general. In general, like they ask a thousand people. Oh, in the majority, what do they choose? Huh? Okay, okay, okay. So like that, I can hear a mountain, a sea of voices. Okay, how many of you think that they, most people would prefer to make their own choice. Please raise your hand. Okay. Who thinks that it is to just let the doctor choose? Oh, yeah, like that answer. Okay, anyway, in that survey, uh, in a less spiritually inclined society, uh, community, the majority asked to make their own choice. They wanted their own choice. But then after that, what they did was to find out, this was hypothetical, right? They asked them what happened. So, then they actually look at actual situations when people had cancer. No, in general, do, would, would people actually go with their own choice or do they actually go by the doctors? They prefer to let the doctor decide. And they found that that first survey where they asked, what's your own preference? 65% asked to make their own choice. But amongst people who had cancer, they actually again looked at the percentage who actually wanted to decide on their own. Well, only 12% okay, wanted to do that on their own. Now, so therefore, I raise this because a lot of time, some of us prefer to have choice. Okay, This one, I don't know, in the Asian society, maybe not. A lot, you know, there are incidents of children wishing to be independent and moving out and so on. A lot of times fights amongst uh, spouses would be, you know, you're not giving me freedom. So people want freedom, right? So presumably, the, the paradox is that people want freedom. But actually, when you find that you have freedom, actually, you and have more choices, you actually have greater unhappiness. And this is actually psychologically uh, proven too. And you have to make choices. Uh, you know that mentally and cognitively, you have to use up more resources. It's actually cognitively more taxing. So actually, it's a source of unhappiness. All right. I'll give you other fallacies uh, of happiness. Now, one of the sufferings uh, that the Buddha talks about, do you know what it is? Not getting what you wanted, right? So this is one of the key uh, elements of key items of suffering. Yes or no? Yes, right? So there are at least two, I hope I remember what they are, two aspects uh, that shows that not, that not getting what you want is suffering. Because, I think I told you that last time, the, the unfortunate point is that getting what you want is also suffering. It's also the start of your suffering. Actually, it's not suffering, but it's the start of your suffering. Do you agree or not? <laughs> so, 
So that's actually if you think about Buddha's words, uh, you have to think about it and say, eh, hey, actually there are more to it than what the Buddha says because the Buddha is is just telling us this, but actually there's more to it. Because not getting what you want, ah, a lot of suffering, no? Not getting the date that I want, not getting the girlfriend, wow, a lot of suffering, not getting the condo I want, not being able to book that condo at a lower price. Wow, this is a lot of suffering. Yes, true, of course. But the point is, when you get that thing, whatever thing that you want, so not getting what you want is suffering, right? This level of level of happiness is here. So this is not getting what you want is here, right? So you get it, what happens? Oh, it goes up, right? But then after that, what happens? Broop, it goes down very quickly because you get what you want. And then, I think I told you before, you, you no longer get that high, isn't it? You can get high only for a while. And then after it drops back to steady state. And then you're looking for another high. For As background for those who were not here, why do our our highs not why are our highs not sustainable? There has been extensive research done, and I re- bear repeating here. They, the point is that the human mind is extremely adaptive. Extremely adaptive meaning to say, therefore, that we adapt very quickly to what our norms are. And the study that I quoted to you last time was that they actually uh, did a longitudinal study of people who lost a limb, okay, and then after that, they tried to find out the level of happiness or suffering then, and then one year later, and then the same thing with someone who won a million dollars, the happiness level there, and then one year later. And amazingly, they found that at the point where they lost a limb or where they got a million dollars, they were very happy, right? More happy than the state before. But what happened was that a year after they lost a limb or became a millionaire, their level of happiness went back to the level before they lost the limb and before they got the, the million dollars. Human subject, subjective sense of well-being adapts very quickly to whatever they were used to before. So if you really wanted that condo, that girlfriend, whatever, sorry, yeah, but whatever you wanted, you get it, you get a peak, but very quickly it goes down back to status quo. And if your pursuit of happiness is that you need peaks, eh, then you're going to be the start of your suffering because then you're looking, looking for something else to pursue to get that peak, isn't it? So therefore, can you not see that it's the pursuit of unhappiness? Once you get something, you are unhappy, you'll get it. You, you'll try to look for another thing to pursue. Pursuit of unhappiness. So not getting what you want is happy, unhappy, is suffering. Getting what you want is the beginning of, of yet another suffering. Alright? So what is actually giving the highs? And here's yet another so-called extension. The, the happiness or perceived or what you think is happiness is actually not so much in the getting, but actually in the pursuit. Oh, you say, what? You know, am I slapping myself and contradicts? Well, a lot of the studies have shown that it's actually the activity, the process that actually gets people very, you know, adrenaline running, getting them uh, excited, which is the pursuit. So if you are pursuing your dream of saving up enough money to get your car, and you're seeing that your bank account keeps going up, do you get a, a kick out of that every day, every month, for those who are in that habit uh, of tracking your bank account and seeing that, whoa, it's going, then you're like, whoa, you know, you're getting high, you know, because every time you see the, you're in that process, when you're going after your boyfriend and girlfriend and with each first, un- first few unsuccessful dates, okay, not, not too great. But after the first date, whoa, very high. The next one, all right, gets happier and happier, right? Of course, there's a law of diminishing returns, uh, but anyway, we don't go into that. But still, <laughs> but still, you know, it's the process, right? And the ultimate disappointment, okay, I should say, uh, start of the disappointment is when you get what you want. Right? Okay. No, sorry. You can disagree. Never mind. But <laughs> yeah, I don't know whether you agree or disagree, but I'm saying that the start of this one is to get, you get what you want. Okay? So, it is a process. So, not getting what you want is suffering. Getting what you want is the start of suffering. It's the process of getting what you want is what people perceive to be happiness. But again, and that's because people are process-driven. I want to just talk about this because I, I, this can't be a Buddhist talk uh, if I don't talk about this. <laughs> and, and this is a story of the pig and the donkey. <laughs> what is this? 
So there was a baby pig and a baby donkey. Do you prefer to be born a baby? Okay, don't even ask that. Okay, don't even think about that. All right. So anyway, there was a baby pig and a baby donkey. And then the baby donkey saw his baby pig, the, his neighbor, his neighbor was, a, because they were put in the same farm, okay, same area. So the baby pig saw the baby donkey, oh, sorry, baby donkey saw the baby pig and saw that the owner was playing favoritism, no? Why? Do you know why the baby donkey is so unhappy? The baby donkey was very unhappy looking at the baby pig. Because they felt that the owner was very unfair. Why? Because the donkey, the, the, donkey, the pig, kept getting a lot of good food. But then the donkey was saying, how come I'm not getting so much, I'm also a baby, you know? All babies are not treated alike, but how come I'm getting so much less food than the baby pig? He says, so unfair, you know? I wish I was a pig. Then he complained and whined and threw tantrum, you know, in front of the father who was the big donkey. Nah. Okay. <laughs> you know why? So the father told the, the baby donkey, he says, oh my son, please, trust me, you are the lucky one. You know why? Because your neighbor there, he's going to end up as ham <laughs> one day. <laughs> Much quicker, okay? You're going to have a long, healthy life, okay? But that, Boy over there, well, you know, he's end up gonna be eating ham and bacon. Understand? Why I'm trying to sing this in in a Buddhist talk about ham and bacon to make you go and eat the ham and bacon. Why? Why am I talking about this? Because we're talking about the pursuit of happiness or the pursuit of unhappiness, right? As a Buddhist, we believe in past lives. Yes? Do we believe in future lives? Of course, we believe in current lives as well. Otherwise, you're not sitting here. Right? Like an apparition sitting here. So, if we believe in your future life, then, eh, I think we better do our sum, isn't it, right? Are you going to be like a pig or are you going to be a donkey? Okay, sorry, that's a very bad example. If I come out of this toy, every one was we are told to be a donkey. <laughs> but, we... <laughs> Figuratively, okay, I should look for a more pleasant sounding animal. But please, remember, again, this is a figment of your imagination because you think your story in your mind is the donkeys are dumb, right? Okay, or obstinate. But no, actually, so, so. But we should more be more like donkeys. <laughs> Why? <laughs> Do you prefer to be a pig or a donkey now? I have to ask you. In that story? Huh? Donkey, but I don't aspire to be an animal, but the donkey is actually the better aspiration. Why? Because it affects how we live our life. If you want to live like a pig, then what do you care about? You will care about current happiness, right? Eat and eat and eat, but very quickly, what? Become ham. <laughs> right, wrong? But if you are the donkey, don't get so much food, but you work hard, right? And maybe, hopefully, the donkey, uh, if karma works that way, because he works so hard, maybe he will have a good rebirth. Okay, whatever. But, <laughs> but this is, I'm stretching the analogy, but so let me, before I actually lose credibility, the stretch analogy, just, just briefly, don the, the pig actually has ple very pre pre present uh, happiness, so to speak, loss of good food, right? But very quickly will meet his demise. Yes or no? But the donkey works hard, has less food, but will have a longer life. Right, wrong? So the analogy from learning from pigs and donkeys huh, is this the following. You know, in our pursuit of happiness, a lot of times we might only be thinking about present life happiness. Present life happiness. But we forget about future life happiness. Do you know what I'm saying? Now, what is present life happiness? Wow, go to discotheque, happy night. For, like, for those who can dance, obviously, you know, for those who are, uh, uh, in terms of motions uh, and act, uh, you know, physical action, who is like, retarded like me, uh, then I don't like to go discotheques. But anyway, discotheque, happy. Movie, happy? Happy. Okay, party, happy? Happy. 
buying clothes happy. Now all these are present moment happiness. Now, it does nothing uh, or very little for our future happiness. Yes or no? So you consume all your happiness now, but without saving for the future. I speak like a banker now. <laughs> so you must buy a product. Uh, don't buy my structured product. No, mine's not a structured product. Mine's a very good investment. So happiness, invest your time and resources for happiness wisely. Don't just consume all the happiness right now. Good returns now, but bad returns in the future. A lot of times uh, when they sell you products, have you not seen those products? Oh, I'll give you 3%, uh, or how many percent in the first three months. Now after that, in the future, uh, basically like 0.2% or very little returns. But that's how they sell people, some of these products. But anyway, back to this. Present moment, short-term happiness is not going to, may not necessarily bring you long-term happiness and be aware of how you invest your time. Pursuit of happiness, pursuit of unhappiness. At a more spiritual level, Pursuit of unhappiness is when, you, whatever you do, you are trying to look for present life happiness without spending a moment to think about whatever we do, whatever we think, whatever we speak. Does it have implications for our future happiness? Be aware, because this directly involves the law of karma. Understand? Involves the law of karma. So what are activities that we, I've just mentioned you, certain activities that will bring us Current moment happiness, so we think, but very little for future happiness. So what are some of the activities that we can pursue or engage in that will bring us both current happiness and future happiness? For example, if you invest your time to actually volunteer periodically okay, in a home or in a Buddhist fellowship where there's good companionship, etc., you, you might feel quite happy, you know, Offering your services. Gone. Ah. Happy now. Happy. Okay. It's present moment happiness. But at the same time, you are also investing in the future because when you participate in some welfare activities, when you are actually engaged in some spiritual activities, this is creating merits. And these merits will be good for your future. Happiness. Yes? So this is these are wise activities to engage in in terms of happiness. When, for example, you go for, you know, you keep your upasata precepts, you keep the eight precepts for one day. For the first time you do it, wow, you feel very unhappy maybe. But let's say you do it for the second time. And for some of us, maybe even the first time you're happy. Because why? You're keeping the precepts for one day, you're in a very serene environment. You make a determination to keep the precepts for one day. Hey, at the end of the day, you say, hey, actually I can do it, you know. So you feel a bit happy about yourself, about what you can do. But keeping the precepts for even one day is again creating a lot of merits for your future rebirths. Yes or no? Very good. All right. Present happiness, future happiness. Now, of course, there may be some activities you feel that a present unhappiness do not got future happiness or not. So, for example, we say, oh, you know, you actually have to keep the precepts of. Okay, I should not say this, but I have to. You know. Not taking intoxicants. Oh, very difficult. My businessman uh, cannot this, cannot that. Right? Cannot, right? Very hard, isn't it? Uh, the ladies are okay. <laughs> businessman. Wow, cannot, cannot keep the piece of not taking intoxicants. A lot of suffering. Because I need... So, so for whatever reasons, I need to drink to get my blood warm. I need to get, do this to get my, my business. Fine. Okay? So you go for this. But then, means that, you know you will find it difficult to keep the five precepts. You cannot proudly tell people that you are keeping your five precepts, right? And you are actually not making a strong effort to keep our mind clear. So whatever it is, um, it's not a judgment, okay? But anyway, some of us may feel that, you know, this is a present moment unhappiness. But think about future happiness. Because the Buddha actually says that you ought to try to keep the fifth precept as well. Buddha didn't say keep the four precepts. Buddha says keep the five precepts. So if you can make a determination to do that, isn't that better, right? If you get another example of present unhappiness and maybe potentially future happiness. I'm not advocating everyone being a vegetarian. But let's say for a day, you say that for one day in a month, okay, I will try not to take any meat product. Why? Not because I'm just fo uh, blindly following a, a practice, but for that one day, I just want to start appreciating the fact that all beings want to be happy. 
And therefore, for that one day, I will not partake in any meal that involves taking a life. Only for that one day. And I will determine to keep that precept for myself for one day. If you can do that, again, maybe you see the, 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 the roast pork, uh, you see the chicken hanging there, you know, by the neck, and you look at it, wow, you salivate. Uh. But if you keep your, your aspiration to yourself for that one day, you know, I will just not take any meat. At the end of it, not because you are a vegetarian, but because of your aspiration that you wanted to actually appreciate all living beings, you wanted to pres- preserve life for that one day. That's a lot of merits. Do you understand? Future happiness, not necessarily present happiness because you're celebrating away, uh, very unpleasant, okay? But future happiness. Do you follow what I'm saying? So, think, therefore, in whatever we do, in whatever you do, about what are the implications for future happiness and present happiness. And this is a big topic because what is future happiness is actually way beyond what I'm telling you right now. But I'm just saying that for the moment, don't just think about now, but think about the future. Invest wisely in the future. Invest your funds well. What are your funds? Your funds are your time. The funds are your resources. The funds are your merits. Huh? You say what? Merits? Yes, merits. Why? Because according to karma, Everything com- arises from causes and conditions, right? So why do you think you have the ability and the money to buy a new shirt or new dress? Why do you think you can just spend money going to the discotheque, etc.? Because you have merits. If you are just going for all this and spending your merits loosely, lavishly, hey, at some point in time, you may not have the merits to do your practice. You may not have merits for your future happiness. Think wisely about that. So... Um, that's all I guess because I think you need to close at 12.15 I, we can take questions Yeah, happy to take any questions thank you brother Tan for the uh, very uplifting talk I think with the laughter I think everybody enjoys very much <laughs> sadu, sadu, sadu. I think we have uh, for me 10 minutes of questions Thank you, Brother Tan, for your interesting talk. I just want to uh, raise some points because you were saying that, yeah, I agree with you that it's the story that we are living in, right? So we can always rewrite the story. Oh, yeah. yeah, so we can always imagine, you know, even like, okay, you know, my husband is not my Prince Charming, but I can always imagine that he's my Prince Charming, right? But then again, right, isn't it equal? I mean, at the end, it still leads to suffering in that sense because you're still pursuing something. It may be a happy story, but towards the end, you may still feel that it's not real, right? Because it's just a story, a, fi- a fraction of imagination. Okay. Right? Uh, uh, you, you yeah, another question. Maybe I tell you. Okay. Another one is, uh, how about just living in the present? Because um, I, I, I do not really agree with you about so-called invest for the, for the, for the future. Because I learned from the Kung Fu Panda, it's like the past is history, the future is mystery. And today, present is actually, uh, no, uh, uh, today is a gift. Yeah, it's a gift, you see. So that's why it's called the present. So now I believe in living in the present because also I read the book by Eckhart Tolle about yeah. the power of now. And I realized that when we actually just live in this present moment, right, it's the same as meditation, but we live at present moment mindfully, not really my- meditating, but we are doing things mindfully always in the present somehow right it will lead you by the nose you know like you 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 will know what to do next i mean it's like you don't have to even plan for the future because it's just there you know it's like oh this is my next time it's like you already see it there right there you see that's what i i, I feel uh. mm. see what what, what, uh, what comment do you have oh, Thanks, bye. well thank you actually the second point is a very important point uh and i actually omitted to talk about it. it's actually the present moment living the present you know we talk about the past we're looking at talking about fi- we're holding on to the past, and then we have certain expectations. And that is when you say that, oh, that good for nothing boyfriend of mine, you know, or girlfriend of mine. Then you have expectations of the future, or in terms of the roles that people play. So all these are about past and future. And then if you have present moment awareness, accepting whatever with with openness, whatever that occurs, you know, that would be the best remedy to any sources of or causes of potential happiness or unhappiness. Oh, that's undisputed. 
Now, going back to this point about investing in the future, uh, I think that can be misinterpreted. So let me just explain a little bit. So we can live with present moment awareness, but my sense is that we still need a direction. We need a path. So for example, therefore, you know, you can, you, what I'm saying is that you can be mindful every moment, but at the same time, you can actually direct your resources along a path, which is your path to future happiness, so which might be the path, the spiritual path. And I think my own sense, at least I need it. I need a particular direction that will lead me to future happiness. But I agree that and I totally subscribe to the view that we have to be present moment and mind, mindfully. We should be mindfully every moment as we walk along on the path. But the path is actually a path that is, in a sense, future-oriented because that will lead us to a so-called aspiration. Um, but that's my view, but we that might not be the right thing because I say I'm... I'm still a wanderer, and I could, I'm still stumbling along, okay, along the path. But that's what my sense is. We need a, for me, I will need a path and a particular direction to go towards. And I forgot your first question, actually. What was your first question? I think it was the story. rewriting the story. Now, re. <laughs> now this rewriting is. Right. This rewriting thing is actually very therapeutic. Very therapeutic because it is actually working on the reverse psychology because of a lot of our happiness is because we are holding on to a script that was we have formed in our mind and the way is to just by a thought we can actually transform. So this is a power of the mind in transforming, right? So that's why we talk about oh, you know, we started by thinking about loving kindness, you know, we may all be well. It's then thought transformation. Buddhism in a sense is about thought transformation. Yeah, right? Now in the end though, I have to tell you that in the end all these are still thoughts. And in the ultimate, even the thoughts actually are empty. You even have to, you have to give up that even that transforming positive mindset is still a figment of the imagination, it will have to be given up. But that transformation, the positive transformation is a useful tool, a useful raft that will actually be able to make us into a more positive being. Do you understand? So that's useful. But in the end, still you have not, you should not be clinging on to that, that thing because otherwise uh, you're always living in fantasy land. Then, the, you know, so that might be an issue. But, but thanks for your wonderful sharing. Yeah. Uh, any uh, questions? I think uh, we have, because of time constraints, because later we have some, uh, uh, what do you call it?